Math 287, Quest to College. I'm Joe Vasta. And today we are covering section 4.8 and 4.9. We'll do them all in one lecture. It's called Rank and Nullity. So let's see what this is all about. I have a matrix A, which looks like this. So in the first few problems, actually first 16 problems, we will be using this matrix right here. And I've done some row operations and put it in row echelon form. In fact, this is reduced row echelon form and I'm going to call this reduced row echelon form matrix, matrix B. So the first question here is what is the rank of A? Well, this is really something from the past. But let's go ahead and figure it out. Rank of A is 2. Now, how did I get 2? To find the rank of any matrix, you reduce it to row echelon form or reduced row echelon form and count the number of non-zero rows. And there are two of them. Okay, let's move on to the next problem here. Problem number two. Solve AX equals B, where B equals 0, 0, 0. Now, I could have written B as a column vector, but I needed some space to do this. So, here we have AX equals B. I'm going to draw or write out the augmented matrix. Okay, so AX equals B, B equals the zero vector. So I could have just said solve AX equals zero, but I did this on purpose. So I draw matrix A. And then I put my equal sign there and put 0, 0, 0. So I put this vector right there. So here's the deal. When I go to do row operations on this augmented matrix, it would be the same row operations that I would do when I was um, going from here to here. And anytime I do a row operation, this column's always going to stay zeros because if I go like negative 2 times row 1 plus row 2 gives me the new row 2 well negative 2 times 0 plus 0 gives me 0 so that's gonna stay 0 and what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna write matrix B down and then the right hand side is gonna be 0 0 0 as well so So the right hand side says 0, 0, 0. So there we have that. So I'm trying to solve this system here and I have how many variables? So see if you can figure that out. Well I have five variables. I'm going to call them x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. I'm going to find my pivots. There's a pivot. There's a pivot. And I'm going to call those variables bound, bound, bound. And then the other three variables I'm going to call free. Now, what I'm actually doing when I solve AX equals zero is I am finding the null space of this matrix. And notice I had two bound variables. 
two also happens to be the rank of the matrix. So the rank of a matrix A is actually the number of bound variables and then I'll put in parentheses when finding the null space. Okay, so the rank is the number of bound variables. Let's continue. Okay, so we have three free variables. I'm going to let x5 equal t. It's free and x4 is free, so x4 is going to equal s and x3 is free so x3 will equal r. Now from the second row I get the equation x2 plus x4 plus x5 equals 0. You see that right there? And so x4 is s and x5 is t. So when you figure this out, x2 is going to equal negative s minus t. Let's circle these right here. Now the first row gives me the equation x1 plus, we go like this, 2x3 minus 4x4 minus x5 equals 0. Well, I know I can replace the x3 with an r, the x4 with an s, and the x5 with a t. And bring them to the other side, so I'm going to get x1 equals negative 2r plus 4s plus t. So it looks like this system has infinitely many solutions and we probably saw that right when we put down a free variable and it would be five tuples that look like this. Negative 2 are, so I'm going to go ahead and write this out, plus 4s plus t, comma, negative s minus t, comma, r, comma, s, comma, t. And I'll write it in the set notation, r, s, t are elements of the real numbers. And we'll put some braces here. There's the answer. So this problem, problem number two, is actually not a new problem. We've done problems like this. So there it is. Okay, let's go ahead and do problem number three. Problem number three, we have the same situation with A and B, and they ask us to find the basis of the null space. Well, we found this problem right here. We found the null space. It was that right there. So I'm going to go ahead and write down this five tuple right here because, you know, we've got so much writing on the other piece of paper. So let's write down the five tuple. This is negative two R. Okay, so we'll write this down. Minus S minus T and then RST. The basis happens to be a minimal spanning set. We're trying to find a set of seeds. So what should we do with this right here? Well, what we should do is we should splatter this. 
So when I splactor it, split and factor, I'm going to write my r. So what do we have here? We have r times negative 2, and then there's no r there, so 0, and then 1, 0, 0, plus, I'll write an s there, so this is going to give me 4, the second tuple has a negative s, so negative 1, and then 0, 1, 0, and then we have plus t, this is going to be 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so I just splacter this. I'll write splacter. And I have a linear combination of how many seeds? I have three seeds, three vectors in R5. So that's the basis. The basis happens to be a list of those three vectors. So let's go ahead and write them down. We have negative 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then we have 4, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, and the third one is 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1. This right here is a basis for the null space. And I'm going to call this set S, just because you don't have to do that. Now, what is the dimension of the null space? Well, to find the dimension, you count the number of elements in any basis, and there's three of them, so the dimension of the null space is 3. Let's go ahead and look at a definition. See if I can find the definition. It's over here. It happens to be in a different part of the room here. And this is actually a definition from 4.9. And there it is. It says the dimension of null space A is called the nullity of A. So this guy right here, dimension null space A, is called the nullity. So look at the next problem. Find the nullity of A. The nullity of A is 3. Now let's take a look at this. 3 happens to be the number of parameters. We got those parameters by assigning the free variables to them. And how many three how many free variables are there? There are three. So the nullity actually equals the number of free variables. when finding the null space. So you gotta admit that the nullity is the number of free variables and the rank is the number of bound variables. So the nullity plus the rank gives you the number of total variables. So rank plus nullity equals the number of columns in your original matrix. Now we'll cover this later, but this is called the rank nullity theorem, where it says the rank plus the nullity equals the number of columns of a matrix.
number of columns represents the variables. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that problem because one problem is going to ask us about that. Find the null space. Now it's true, there's the null space right there. We did that. But we're going to write it in a more professional way. The null space is really the span of those guys. So I don't, I don't want to write the whole thing again, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to say span of s. So there's a reason I said that equals s. So that's what the null space is. Now if you're like, well, Joe, you were lazy. I want to write the span and then write up that thing. You can. That's the more professional way of um, grabbing onto these because then you can see it's a span of a basis. Here, you don't really see the span of a basis. This is still the null space. But this is how the big boys do it. They write it using span. Okay. Let's go ahead and do some more problems. The next problem. Can't get this up there, okay. It's something where it requires a definition. Because they have row space. So matrix has a row space. So every matrix has a rank, every matrix has a nullity. Every matrix also has a row space, and we're supposed to find the basis and the dimension and find out what the row space is. So I think it's probably best to look at the definition of row space. So here it is. This is from 4.8, row space and column space. You have a, a matrix A, which is M by N in size. The row space of A is the subspace of Rn spanned by the row vectors of A. It is denoted by row space A. So you're just spanning the rows. That's all it says. So let's go ahead and write out the row space. Row space of A is span of the three rows. So let's write that out. One, three, two, negative one, two, two, seven, four, negative one, five, and then this one is negative one, negative one, negative two, three, zero. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, the deal is, our first problem that we want to do is we want to write a basis for this. The question is, are these vectors, do they form a basis? So I should say it that way. Do these three vectors form a basis for, not for R5, because we know they don't, you need five of them, but for a subspace that they're spanning. Is this the span of a basis? Or another way of writing this, is there any dead weight in here? Okay, well, here's the deal. When you go to do row operations on a matrix, and I go like negative two times row one plus row two gives me the new row two. When I do that, I'm actually going negative two times this vector plus this vector, and then we replace that vector by that. So when you do row operations, you're really just doing linear combinations of the rows. So you can sort of massage this, that's probably a bad word to use, massage this matrix using row operations into this matrix. And so what you actually find is that the span of these three rows happen to be the span of these three rows. And what do you notice about these three rows in matrix B? You notice there's one row of zeros there, which means one of these guys is dead weight. 
So all that stuff that I was saying, let's just look at two theorems and then we'll come back to these three problems. If A is row equivalent to B, then row space A equals row space B. Okay, because the rows are preserved, or the span of the rows are preserved by the row operations. Theorem. So this is going to help us get this first problem done. The non-zero rows of any row echelon form of A form a basis for row space A. So a basis for row space A happens to be set of seeds. It's not going to be those three seeds. We already know because we can um, we can reduce this down to this. We know that there's going to be a row of zeros and there's really only going to be from the theorem two vectors. It's going to be this vector here and this vector there. So here it is. This is one, zero, two, negative four, negative one, and then we have zero, one, zero, one, one. And that's it, because this is a basis you cannot put zero, the zero vector, zero, 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 into a basis. So what is the dimension of the row space of this matrix? Well, if a basis only has two elements, the dimension is two. And the reason that theorem makes sense is because row operations on A are just linear combinations of the vectors in row space A. So there it is. So you get another one in your homework and they ask you to find the row space or a basis of the row space of, of um, any matrix. The first thing you do is put it in row echelon form. You don't need to put it in reduced row echelon form. And then you just go ahead and write out the non-zero rows for the basis. Okay. So now what is the row space A? So some of you, some of you are thinking, hey, I could just write this. But the problem with writing this is it's not simplified. Whenever we, we want to describe a vector space or a subspace, we never want to write the span of something that is not a basis. We never want to write the span of something that has dead weight because that would be like writing two-fourths as your answer in a math class when you know you should probably write what? One-half. So you would rather, when they ask row space, write your answer as the span of a basis. So we can go span of that. And we can just, we could physically just pick this up and put it there. That would be the answer. But because I'm a lazy guy, I'm going to say that this set right here, which contains those, I'm going to call that set T. And then look what I'm going to do. Row space of A is span T. And it's a lot better writing span of this than writing span of that because we don't like to present our vector spaces as span of things that have dead weight. We like span of basis. That's going to be the simplified. That's going to be the one half instead of the two fourths. So I hope this is making some sense. It's actually hard to do these videos because I'd rather have interaction with the students and we can't do that so we have to do this instead so here it goes oh and I've, I have considered zoom meetings but um being into efficiency this is going to be a lot more efficient I've talked to other teachers who do zoom meetings and they have to record them and we're just going to do this. The advantages of seeing your lectures on YouTube is you can pause them. You can't pause a Zoom session unless, of course, you're watching the video. And then in that case, you're watching the video anyway. Um, and so hopefully this class is working out for you. Let's do some more problems.
So we have a row space. We also have something called the column space. So let me go ahead and show you the definition of column space. That's what they're going to ask on the next few problems. I uh, might as well just tell you it's pretty much the same thing as the row space except with columns. The column space of a matrix is the subspace of Rm spanned by the column vectors of A. It is denoted by call space A. So we shorten it to just call space instead of always writing column. And so it's the span of the columns. Let's go ahead and move on to this right here. So they're asking for a basis for the call space. Let's just go ahead and write out the call space. Call space of A is span of the columns. How many columns do I have? I have five columns, so I'm going to write them all out. One, two, negative one, three, seven, negative one, two, four, negative two, negative one, negative one, three, two, five, zero. Okay, so we have that and we ask ourselves a question. Well, is this a basis? The set, forget about the span, is that set of five vectors a basis for a subspace? And the answer is absolutely not because they are vectors in R3 so you already know that there's just too many of them. There's some dead weight in there. So they're asking for a basis of call space. So I have to figure out who the dead weight happens to be. Now you might say, well, can't we just do the same thing over here and reduce it and do something? Well, when you do row operations, um, row operations do not preserve call space. Okay. So to find a basis, let's kick out, kick out the dead weight in this group. How do you kick out the dead weight? I'm going to set up. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do something here. And then, like, if you had to do one in your homework, we're going to try to um, come up with a better way of doing this. Okay, so we should be able to just look at this and write it down. But right now, we can't do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out linear combinations of these. So C1, we have 1, 2, negative 1 plus C2. The next one is 3, 7, negative 1 plus C3. 2, 4, negative 2 plus C4. Negative 1, negative 1, 3 plus C5. 2, 5, 0. And this is going to equal 0, 0, 0. Now, I'm going to get three equations and five unknowns. The first equation is going to be C1 plus 3C2 plus 2C3 minus C4 plus 2C5 equals 0. So essentially, I'm going to skip right in that equation and I'm going to jump right to the augmented matrix. And then the next one is going to be 2C1 plus 7C2 plus 4C3 minus C4 plus 5C5 equals 0. And the last one is negative C1 minus C2 minus 2C3 plus C3, C3PO okay plus 4c4 and then um, 0c5 and then we have 0 okay so now I have to figure out who's the dead weight but look at this what does this remind you of 
right here. I'll circle part of this. That right there is matrix A. So when you go to find the dead weight, you reduce this, which is already reduced here. And actually, these zeros, like if you had the zeros, there would be a zero here, a zero here, and a zero here. And here are the leading ones. Those guys are going to be bound. Whereas the other three columns will end up being free. Now remember what we said the free variables were. They're freeloaders, they're dead weight, and so the vectors that are doing all the work are the first two. Happen to be, so look at this, this is bound and bound. So these are the guys who are doing all the work. these guys they're dead weight so what does this mean this means well let's write our answer and then we'll look at some theorems the basis for the call space would just then be those two green vectors which is one two negative one, then three, seven, negative one. So there is a basis for the call space. Now let's look at some theorems. Or one theorem at least says this. The set of column vectors of A corresponding to those column vectors containing leading ones in any row echelon form of A is a basis for call space. It's a little wordy, but it's a theorem. It basically says this. If you have to find a basis for the call space, you reduce the matrix to row echelon form, find the columns that have the leading ones and then go back to the original columns that have those, you know, that correspond to the leading ones, which were the first two. Those happen to be a basis for the call space. So you might say, well, can I just take the columns from the reduced matrix? No, because then you would have 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0 instead of that. And the last coordinate on both of them would be 0. And there's no way you can do a linear combination and get something that has a non-zero in the last coordinate. But here you can. So when you're looking for a basis for the call space, reduce the matrix, go back to the original and put those for your basis. Now when looking for row space, We'll use a different color. Okay, so now I know I'm changing this a little. You reduce the matrix to row echelon form and you go with the rows of the reduced matrix. Okay, so row space basis use the reduced matrix call space basis, reduce the matrix, but use the original matrix that correspond to the leading ones. Okay, now some of you might say, well on this problem, what if I put 1, 3, 2, negative 1, 2, and 2, 7, 4, negative 1, 5, for when we were looking for a basis for the row space. On this problem, if you did that, this particular problem, you would get the right answer, but by luck. See, if you have like 10 rows and there's a linear, uh, there's a dependency relationship within the first three and you do all your row operations and you end up having like five rows of zeros and the other five you have stuff in them and then you just pick the first five in the original matrix, you're going to be throwing away information because there's, are, there's some dead weight in the first five rows. So 
That's why with row space you always want to go and pick up the rows, the non-zero rows of the reduced matrix. Whereas call space is a different story. You, you use those leading ones, but you want to pick up the original columns. So make sure you know that. One is from you pick up the rows from the new reduced matrix and the other one you pick up the columns from the original matrix. But you're reducing the matrix each time because you are finding, like here for, for row space, you are finding the rows that contain the leading ones. So there's two leading ones, so there's two rows. And then over here you're looking at the columns that have the leading ones and then you go back to the original columns. So what is the dimension of call space? The dimension of call space happens to be 2. Okay, so there it is. Now in terms of row space, there may be some books, you know, call space, row space. I've seen some books say that let's find the call space and then what they'll do with the matrix is they'll consider a transpose and to find the call space then they end up finding the row space of a transpose. If that was too confusing then just forget what I just said. But you may be reading some other books and they might take different approaches to this. But you're still doing row operations. Okay, what's the call space? Well, the call space really is span of those five vectors, but that's like writing 10 over 20 for your answer. You want to write one half. You want to write the span of a basis. Do we have a basis for the call space? It's this guy right here. And you know what? Because I'm lazy, I'm going to call it U. And so the call space is the span of U. So there's the answer for that. And so, how many elements are in U? Two. How many elements are in the span of U? Infinitely many. Okay, because you're taking all linear combinations of these. So that's what we have in terms of row space and call space. Um, we're going to have a theorem that says something about the dimension of those. And let's think about, we can actually do that theorem right now. So here's call uh, row space where we have, um, we pick up the rows that have the leading ones. And call space, we pick up the original columns that correspond with the leading ones. So it would seem because you're always going off the leading ones that the row space, the dimension of row space, which in this case was two, is going to equal the dimension of call space, which is two. And so that's what our next theorem says. It says the dimension of row space equals the dimension of call space. And also that equals the rank of the matrix because the rank, you reduce the matrix and you count your non-zero rows or you count your leading ones. So here is the theorem. It says dimension of row space equals dimension of call space equals rank. I know I keep putting papers over other papers. Hopefully this is this is all bearable for you guys. So here it is. Number 13. This is I don't think you'll get anything like this in your homework where it says this, but this asks us to um, verify the theorem about dimensions. Well, it just says that the dimension of row space. So let's just say row space of A should equal the dimension of call space of A which should equal the rank of A. So when they want us to verify this theorem, well we already found the dimension of the row space was 2 which should equal the dimension of the call space which is 2 which should equal the rank of the matrix which we found to be 2. So 2 equals 2 equals 2 is our answer. Let's go ahead and box that. It's a weird kind of problem, isn't it? The next one's going to be just as weird. The rank nullity theorem. Okay, so we're done with theorems and definitions from 
4.9 has a theorem called the rank nullity theorem. And I kind of verbally told you what that was. It says the rank plus the nullity equals the number of columns of A, which is N. I guess we'll just call it N. So it just says the bounds, the bound variables plus the free variables equal the number of variables. Kind of a dumb theorem, but actually a very important theorem. So when you reduce this, suppose you were trying to find the null space, but I'm not going to put the column of zeros. Um, and you had this, and you had this, and you, you found that these guys were bound, bound, and then the other three guys were the free loafers. Remember, free, free, free. What the rank nullity theorem says is the number of bound variables, two, plus the number of free variables, which is three, equals the number of variables. How many variables are there? One, two, three, four, five, when finding the null space. Or it actually is the number of columns of your matrix, which is five. So the answer to rank nullity theorem, verify that on this example, there it is. And basically it just says rank plus nullity equals number of columns of your matrix. Or a simpler way of putting it is bounds plus freeze equals the number of variables, vars. Okay, so that's problem number 14, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Joe, this is kind of dumb. Well, it is. Is it? I don't know. Let's go ahead and do problem number 15. Let's see how we're doing with time. 42 minutes. Okay, let's take a look at number 15. I think we have 19 problems to do. And look what we have. It's the same A that we saw in the other problems. And it says, solve AX equals B. B is 1, 3, 1. So here's matrix A right here. So it's the same matrix. Now, I've kind of done this problem for you almost. Okay, so we'll, we'll figure out the solution here. I put matrix, so the A augmented is going to be that. So remember, let's go back to this. When they ask us to solve this problem and it said AX equals B, B equals 0, 0, 0, and I went ahead and I put 0, 0, 0 there, now I'm putting 1, 3, 1 there. Now as I do row operations, the 1, 3, and the 1 will um, change around. And in fact, so when I did row operations, you, you get the same thing right here. This, this 3 by five matrix right there is actually always going to be the same thing if, you, if A is the same matrix. But these guys, you know, I had 0, 0, 0 and they didn't change in problem 2. Well now they've changed to negative 2, 1, 0. So let's go ahead and put some variables here. So I, we don't have to do any row operations because I did them for us. I'm going to call this x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. I'm going to identify my pivots and my bound variables. So I have bound, bound, free, free, free. Well this looks familiar because this is the this same matrix A. You know this 3 by 5 matrix is matrix A so we've kind of done this. And so we say x5 is T because he's free. X4 is free as well so we'll call him S. X3 is free so we'll call that R. And let's see the second row says X2 plus X4 plus X5 gives me 1. And so I'm trying to solve for x2 here. X, and this seems very familiar. I think when I was doing problem number 2, 
I had a 0 there instead of a 1. But anyway, let's continue. x2 equals x4 is s, x5 is t, so negative s minus t plus 1. So there's x2. We have the first row, which is x1 plus 2x3 minus 4x4 minus x5. Now when I was finding the null space, or when that was 0, 0, 0, this equaled 0. But this is going to equal negative 2. Well, I know that x3 is r, and x4 is s, and x5 is t. So when I figure out what x1 is, I end up getting negative 2r plus 4s. I'm substituting the parameters in and moving things to the other side of the equation all in the same step. And then I have plus t and then minus 2. So when I write out my answer, look at this, I have for x1 negative 2r plus 4s plus t minus 2 and then the next one is minus s minus t plus 1 we have here we have R S T okay so look what I'm going to do I'm going to splatter this now look at this when I did problem number two look at my answer it was pretty much this, except I, the parts that I put in blue. I have a minus 2 right there, and I have a plus 1 right there. So that's kind of interesting. And in some way, even though this is all theoretical, this is going to tie in so nicely to differential equations, which we haven't started doing. So I'm going to splatter this, and I end up getting r, and so this is going to be negative 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus s, this is um, what s we have, 4, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, plus t, which is negative, no, not negative. This is going to be 1. Negative 1, 0, 0, 1, plus, now I'm just going to write a 5 tuple that has just the constants. Negative 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, squeezing it in right there. And so look, this, this guy right here is the null space of your matrix. That's the null space of your matrix. Plus what? Another vector from R5 solves this linear system when Rb is 1, 3, 1. That's amazing. So Lots of times what we like to do is, you know, R, S, and T, they are parameters, but I'm going to switch those to um, C's. So this is going to be C1 times this. Plus, and I'm just switching them. Okay, so S, I'll call C2, C2. And we have 4, negative 1, 0, 1, 0. And then T I'll call C3. 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1. And then this is plus what? 
well, we'll just keep this here, negative 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, this vector right here is part of the basis for the null space. So what I'm doing, so I'm kind of done with this problem, but I want to show you something that's really cool. This guy right here, we're going to just relabel that guy. We'll call him maybe a vector. I mean, isn't he a vector? We'll call him vector x1. So this is c1 x1 bar, okay, because it's a vector, plus, we'll move this up, c2 x2 bar plus c3 x3 bar plus, okay, so this blue vector, this is just a vector too, so I'm going to um, call it x sub p. Okay, so that p is going to stand for something. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that. This right here, c1 x1 bar plus c2 x2 bar plus c3 x3 bar is the solution to the homogeneous linear system ax equals 0. So that's the homogeneous ax equals 0. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this guy equals x homogeneous bar and then the other guy is x p bar and so this is the solution now I know you're saying well Joe is that how we should write our answer no our answer is like up here okay it's this part right here but the deal is whenever you solve any linear system ax equals b then it can be broken down into the null space plus a particular solution. And so that's going to be our next theorem. So now, before we get to that theorem, suppose I went ahead and picked another vector. Vector B is something else. Well, if this thing actually had a solution, I would end up getting the same answer except XP would equal something else. So here is the theorem. We can show the theorem here. If xp is a particular solution to ax equals b, then every solution can be written as x equals xh plus xp, where xh is the solution to ax equals 0, which means it's, it's the null space. The dimension of the null space is nullity. Furthermore, B must be in the call space. Okay, so this is the part I didn't say, and we will see this. So for this to work, this B, for AX equals B, to have a solution, B must be in the call space of matrix A. So that would mean, that we really don't have any more room on this paper to write it. I'll write it down here that this vector B, 1, 3, 1, B, which equals 1, 3, 1, is an element, so that's what is an element of call space of A. And we could actually verify that. We did find the call space, didn't we? So we could say 1, 3, 1 equals linear combination of these, and I bet we would be able to find a C1 and a C2 where we could write 1, 3, 1 as a linear combination of this. Um, actually, just thought of a way. I just found a linear combination in my head. If, if you have 1 times that vector, minus 2 times the first vector. So 1 times this vector minus 2 times that. So that gives me the first coordinate of 1. 7 minus 4 is 3. And then 1 times this minus 2 times that. So that's going to give me a 2 and a negative 1, which is a 1. So yes, this guy is a linear combination of um, the basis for call space. Now that theorem would also suggest that what would happen if you 
ended up picking a B that was not in the call space of A, what do you think would happen? Well, probably what would happen is you would end up getting no solution. Let's go ahead and see what happens. Well, we have another problem here. It's problem number 16. So this one's going to be shorter because it's what I said was going to happen. You have AX equals B. So in the last problem, B was 1, 3, 1. Now this is 4, 2, 0. And we put it right there. I did all the row operations for you. And what do you see in the last row? You see that 0 equals 1, which means solve AX equals B when B is that. This is no solution or inconsistent if you'd like. So we're done with this problem, but this would mean that this B, which is up here, so let's just write it as a column vector, 4, 2, 0, is not in the call space of A. Whereas 1, 3, 1 was in the call space and we were able to find a solution. So what does this mean like in terms of applications? Absolutely nothing. I'm just kidding. So I've worked with cryptography where we had to multiply some matrices and maybe you're doing some cryptography where A is fixed and every time you run the, the machine you switch your B and you, your cryptography depends on getting a solution to this. Well, the deal is, because we have this theory where AX equals B will have a solution if B is in the call space, which you want to do if you're just generating vector Bs for the cryptography, is you do linear combinations, maybe randomly or however you want to do, of the call space basis elements, and then that's what you pick for B to guarantee your system will have a solution and won't end up like this one because this will crash the program. So this is very important stuff. Um, and all we've done is we started off with a three by five matrix. And we've said, oh, well, there's this thing called the null space. And we have rank, nullity, call space, row space. And then we started solving things like this and realized that when you go AX equals B, B has to come from the call space of A in order for us to have consistency, for us to have um, at least one solution. Okay. Let's continue now with a few more problems. Now, 17, I'm going to switch things up. We're not going to call A the same thing we've been calling it. Okay, so now you know, when you see A in the next problem, um, I'm redefining A. Okay, It's kind of like when you were in a lower math class and you did some problems with f of x, and then your next problem was f of x, but they switched the function on you. So that's what we're doing here. We are going to find the rank, nullity, null space, row space and call space of this 3 by 3 matrix. Okay, so in order to do that, what you want to do, you know, because you're trying to find rank, nullity, null space, all that stuff, it would be nice to just know what this thing reduced to. And it didn't take me much time to do that, so I'm going to go ahead and do row operations, 1, 1, negative 1, and um, I'll just do them for you so you don't have to do this. So this is 0, 1, negative 2, and 0, 0, 1. Okay, so those are some row operations. So this tells you, I mean, if I could actually keep going, I could use this pivot to put a 0 there and a 0 there and use this pivot to put a 0 there right above it. So if I kept going to reduced row echelon form, I'd end up getting the identity. So when they ask me some questions, so before I do that, let's just say that A is invertible. 
Now, we couldn't do this with a non-square matrix, but with a square matrix, you know, A is either invertible or non-invertible. And let's go ahead and find some things. I'm going to actually find the null space first. So to find the null space, wouldn't I write A augmented? So what I'm going to start doing in this class is when I find the null space of a matrix, I'm just going to do row operations on the matrix, and then I can say, oh, well, what, that's a zero, that's a zero, and that's a zero. Okay. So I'm kind of squeezing in that column of zeros, and when I do row operations, they're still going to be zeros. And they're still going to be zeros right here. And so basically, I mean, whatever your variables are for this, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We can say this is X, this is Y, this is Z. Some of you are thinking, no, you should put C1, C2, C3 there. It doesn't matter. Tomato, tomato. But look, Z is zero, Y is zero, X is zero. And you could have done the same thing here. Z is zero, and then Y minus two Z is zero, so Y is zero, etc. So your null space, and I'll shorten it here, null space of A, is really zero, zero, zero. Okay, we're not going to write a basis or anything like that. We're just going to say there's the null space. Let's look for the row space. The row space of A is the span of the rows, but what you do is you reduce it to row echelon form or reduced row echelon form and you pick up the non-zero rows. How many non-zero rows do you have? You have three of them. You have this one, this one, and this one. Or you could pick up these three as well. So the row space is actually the span of the three rows in a row echelon form. So I'm one, zero, zero, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, what is the span of i, j, and k? Isn't that just R3? So there's the row space. So the null space is the zero vector. The row space is R3, the call space. To get a basis for the call space, I look at where the leading ones are, and I could look at them here, and then I go back to the original matrix, and um, I pick up the columns there, and I span them. So span of 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, negative 1, 1, 0. Well, that's a basis, and guess what? That's a basis for R3. Span of those three vectors is also R3. The call space and the row space are actually equal to each other. Let's find the rank of A. We could have done this right off the bat and I was actually going to. The rank is the non-zero rows or let's just put bound, bound, bound. The rank is the number of um, bound variables and there are three of them so the rank is three. What is the nullity of your matrix? The nullity is the dimension of the null space or the number of free variables and we talked about this in an earlier lecture the dimension of the null space when it's just the zero vector is just zero. The rank nullity theorem, so we're done with this problem, says the rank plus the nullity, 3 plus 0, equals 3, which is the number of columns, or actually you could say the number of variables. So this problem was kind of a unique problem. Um, and so we have this theorem, it's the last theorem of 4849 called the invertible matrix theorem. And last time we saw this, it was in um, 2.6. So we've added some conditions to this. We've added, I think, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. A is invertible. AX equals B has a unique solution for every B and RN. AX equals 0 has 
only the trivial solution. The rank of A is N, A is rho equivalent to I N. So we have that all happening with this, okay? Um, so here's some new ones that uh, we've actually mentioned this, the determinant of A is non-zero, so A is invertible. A transpose is invertible. Okay, that's hopefully, you know, that could have been mentioned a lot earlier. The nullity of A is what? Zero. So if you can, if you find that the nullity of A square matrix is zero, then your matrix is invertible. The nullity is zero, the rank is N. The call spaces are in, in our case it was R3, i.e. the columns of A form A basis, and the row space is Rn. That is, the rows of A form A basis for R3 or Rn. And so this is the invertible matrix theorem, which is growing, and it will continue to grow as we go through linear algebra. So this is only the case when you have a square matrix. So it wasn't the case when we had the 3 by 5 matrix because then we don't consider invertible matrices. But when you have an invertible matrix, all this stuff is true. And there's a time and a place for when that's good. So what I'm going to do on the next problem is I'm going to go ahead and use the same matrix and we're going to solve this. Now remember the row space of A, which we computed, the row space is R3. So when you have an invertible matrix, and I'm, I'm going AX equals B, and I just randomly pull a B, well, if that's an R3, I'm good to go. I'm not going to have a no solution. I'm going to have some legitimate solution. In fact, the theorem says AX equals B has a unique solution for this vector here. Okay, so here's my next problem, and I'm not actually going to do this problem, okay? Because it's something you can do on your own, and we've done this many times. The reason I have this problem, um, so I'll go dot, 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 and say, okay, well, there's an answer. And the answer that I got was 1, 0, 2. And so I can check that by, like, if I just take this vector and put it right on top of that and do multiplication, 1 times 1, 0, and then 2, so that gives me negative 1, and then 1 and 2 is 3, and then I have, and then the zeros, and then 1, and then 0, and then 0 gives me 1. I'm really taking this answer just to verify that it that I did give you a correct answer, and I'm writing it as a column and doing a quick matrix multiplication and getting the B. The problem, the problem isn't that, okay, so I have the answer, the answer is this, but I want to show you something really cool, and we never did this in chapter two because it would have freaked you out, but your answer to any linear system, when you do get an answer, is always going to be the null space or the homogeneous solution plus a particular solution, and in this example, what was the null space? Wasn't the null space 0, 0, 0? So this part, x sub h bar, is 0, 0, 0 plus the particular solution is 1, 0, 2. Not that we would say, hey, let's write our answers like this from now on, but we are making the connection that your solutions to linear systems are the homogeneous part plus the particular part. It just so happens that when we hit differential equations, we're going to have differential equations, and when we solve them, because they're all based on linear algebra, or at least the ones that we're doing, um, they the solution, and there will be y instead of x bar, y will equal y sub h, which is the homogeneous solution, plus y sub p, which is the particular solution. And so with differential equations, we're going to see that this really is the driving force, this x sub h plus x sub p. Okay, so this wasn't much of a problem. Let's go do our last problem, because they give these in the homework. And if I don't do this, I think people may be confused, okay? So it says, find a basis for the subspace of R3 spanned by these guys. So if there's no dead weight, 
then this itself, these three vectors themselves, happen to be a basis, and the subspace would then be R3. Um, but if there's some dead weight, then we've got to find it. That's basically what they're asking you to do. They're asking you, really, they're just saying, are those guys independent? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go C1, and then we have negative 1, 2, 5, plus C2, 3, 0, 3, plus C3, 5, 1, 8, equals the zero vector of R3. Okay, so I have negative C1. I've skipped this step in the past, but I'm going to write it out plus... 3C2 plus 5C3 equals 0. And the next one is 2C1 and then 0C2 and then C3 equals 0. And the last one is 5C1 plus 3C2 plus 8c3 equals 0. So basically what are you doing? You are doing this right here. You are going negative 1, 2, 5. I'm writing the augmented matrix. 3, 0, 3. And those are those vectors putting, loading up the columns here. And then we have 5, 1, 8, 0, 0, 0. And so when I do row operations, and I'm not going to show you the row operations. What I ended up getting was 1, negative 3, negative 5, and then 0, 6, 11, and then 0, 0, 0. And I'm not going to put it in row echelon form completely because I don't want to go ahead and write this as 11 over 6. But what this is showing me, here's a pivot, here's a pivot. This is C1, C2, C3. This is bound, bound, free. So who's the freeloader? Who's the dead weight? The dead weight is associated with C3, which is this guy. And so our final answer, find a basis for the subspace spanned by these guys. Well, a basis would be kicking out all the dead weight, negative one, two, five, three, zero, three. Now that's how I'm going to do the problem. Your book's going to do the problem a different way. I like this way because it's the way we can do it. We're used to actually when we have vectors in R3 is loading up the columns with those vectors. And so we got this. The book's going to um, ask you, they're going to say, use the ideas of this section. You can just ignore that. So I will actually do what the book wants you to do and show you another answer. Um, but one thing I want to point out is when you're writing a basis and you have 303, you could always scale this. So you can write this as 101 and it would give you the same, uh, it would be a different basis because this element 101 is different from 303. But when you span them, it would give you exactly what you want. It would give you the same subspace as the one that is spanned by that. So let's go ahead and I think I need another piece of paper here. We're going to do it the book's way. Okay, so I'll do this in blue. Okay, the book's way is, so we have negative 1, 2, 5, and then we have 3, 0, 3, and then we have 5, 1, 8. So what the book wants you to do, it says use the ideas of this section to do this. Just ignore that part in your homework. But here it is anyway. So this is the book's way. Book's way. They say, well, put these three vectors into a matrix along the rows. And we're not used to doing that. That's why I am kind of discouraging this way. You know, I'm like, well, we really don't want to do this. But let's just show you that it still does work. So now I've put those three vectors into the rows. And the next thing I'm going to do is find a basis for row space. How do I do that? By reducing this to row echelon form. So I'm not going to show you all the details on that, but when I did that, I got 1, negative 2, negative 5. And then I have 0, 1, 3. 
and then this is zero, zero, zero. So a basis for the row space, because isn't this, these three rows are gotten from those vectors, happen to be just those two non-zero vectors. So your book's gonna say, oh, look, we found the answer. It is one, negative two, negative five, zero, one, three. And that's gonna be their answer. And when you look at these answers, they look different. Um, let's see, one, negative two, five. Okay, here it is. So that one looks the same, but that one looks different. So you might be thinking, oh no, am I doing the problem wrong? Well, here's the deal. I've posted the answers to the evens and the odds on these ones and, and did it the way that I do it, which is this way. This is the book's way. Now, these two vectors span a plane. I better use purple ink. You probably don't want to write this down. And so I'm going to find the plane, the equation of the plane. And so this goes back to calculus three or whatever. So I'm going to do a cross product. So you don't have to know how to do this in this class. Okay, so the cross product gives me um, negative six plus a five, so that's negative one. And then the cross product here gives me three and then a zero, so that's a three, but it's a negative three. And then I'm really kind of doing a determinant with an i, j, a, k on the top. And then I end up getting a one, and then that's a one. And so this gives me negative x minus 3y plus z equals a constant d. But if I went and put one of those points into here, I would end up getting that d is 0. Yes, so then there is the equation of the plane. And let's do the equation of the plane here. So this is negative 1, 2, 5, 3. I'm just showing you that the span of these guys, which is a plane, is the same as the span of these guys, which is the same plane. I didn't plan on doing this, so I hope I hope I get the right answer. So look at this. This gives me, I, I'm doing the cross product, which is not covered in this class, so this is six. So you're already going, ha ha, you didn't get it. Okay, well let's just keep going. This is gonna be minus three, minus 15, which is negative 18. But it's going to be positive because it's the middle one. And then the last one is 0, and then we have minus 6. So then um, when I do that, I end up getting 6x plus 18y minus 6z equals a constant d. But if I go ahead and throw in one of those points, I'll end up seeing that the constant d is 0. Now, those two equations are the same because if I divide everything by a negative 6, I get negative x minus 3y, so I'm dividing everything by negative 6, plus z equals 0. So yeah, um, I did the cross product on both of those and I got exactly the same plane, which means when you span this set, you end up getting all the vectors on this plane which means our original problem, they gave us three vectors. All three of those vectors were on the plane. So there was one that's kind of inefficient. We crossed it out, the 5, 1, 8. Well, this was a very long section. It's because it was two sections. This was 4, 8 and 4, 9. Do your homework and have a good day. See you in the next video.